Hello everyone and welcome to this video which demonstrates a tricky case of variceal bleeding. A 50 year old ex-publican was admitted to hospital in the early hours of the morning with a 24 hour history of three episodes of hematemesis and episodes of melina. Further hematemesis was witnessed in the A&E department. He had a history of alcohol excess, consuming over 50 units of alcohol per week over many years. Comorbidities included obesity and obstructive sleep apnea, which was treated with nocturnal CPAP. He was on no medications, but did use Brufen a month earlier. On initial examination, he was obese, weighing 110 kilograms, with a BMI of 40.7. He was jaundiced, but not encephalopathic. There was tachycardia with a heart rate of 130 beats per minute and the initial blood pressure was 110 over 78 millimeters mercury. There was no ascites clinically and a rectal examination confirmed melina. The initial diagnosis was alcohol-related liver disease plus or minus metabolic-associated fatty liver disease with upper GI bleeding possibly secondary to varices. Initial investigations showed a haemoglobin of 109 grams per litre, falling to 89 a few hours later. The urea was 9.0, which is unusually high in advanced alcohol-related liver disease. The bilirubin was elevated at 60 micromoles per litre. The liver synthetic function was poor, with INR of 1.7 and albumin of 34. He was child pew class B, scoring 9 over 15, and the new MEL score was 16. Initial management included intravenous fluids, terlipressin, antibiotics and intravenous protein pump inhibitors. He was kept nil by mouth and blood was cross-matched. An urgent upper GI endoscopy was performed approximately 12 hours after admission. We now see the upper GI endoscopy. In the lower esophagus, there are three or four small varices with no red sign or other stigmata. The stomach initially appears to be empty. However, on retrosection, we see fresh blood in the fundus and upper stomach. We will come back and examine this area in detail in a moment. The patient is retching and is having trouble retaining air. So we administer some more sedative and check the duodenum. The duodenum is blood free and looks unremarkable to at least the second part. Back in the stomach, the views of the fundus are now clearer and the retching has stopped. There are definite gastric varices present in the fundus of the stomach. Hence, this is gastroesophageal varices type 2 or GOV2 according to the Sarin classification. One of the gastric varics appears to have a punctum on its surface. Could this have been the site of a recent bleed? At this stage, we decide to treat the gastric varices with histoacryl glue. To glue the varices, we need the histoacryl glue, which is N-butyl 2 cyanoacrylate in this case, lipoidal, and five syringes, including one 5 mL syringe, three 2.5 mL lower lock syringes, and one 10 mL syringe. Syringe 1 is loaded with 5 mL of lipoidal. Syringe 2 is loaded with 2 mL of lipoidal. Syringe 3 is loaded with a mixture of 0.5 mL of glue and 0.7 mL of lipoidal. 
syringe 4 is loaded with 2 mils of the poidal and syringe 5 is loaded with 10 mils of sterile water. All the staff in the room have donned eye protection and the patient's eyes are also protected in case there is glue spray which really should not occur if lure lock syringes are used. Syringe 1 is used to prime the channel of the scope with lipoidal. Syringe 2 is used to prime the 23 gauge injection needle with lipoidal. Syringe 3 containing the glue is injected into the dead space of the needle. Syringe 4 containing the lipoidal pushes the glue from the dead space of the needle into the varix. Finally, syringe 5 containing water is used to flush the needle prior to the next round of injection if necessary. We rejoin the case as syringe 2 is being used to prime the needle with lipoidal. The needle is inserted into the gastric varics near the punctum and syringe 3 containing the glue and lipoidal mixture is injected. The total volume of syringe 3 is 1.2 mils. The glue is now residing in the dead space of the needle and to push it into the varics syringe 4 containing 2 mils of lipoidal is now injected. The glue should now be in the varics. We must now wait for polymerization to occur before withdrawing the needle. In the past, I have found that a wait of 20 seconds is usually enough for polymerization to occur. I therefore wait for around 20 seconds and slowly pull the needle back. However, as soon as I do this, there is spurting of blood from the injection site. If this happens, don't panic. It means that polymerization has not occurred yet. So, retract the needle tip and use the blunt end of the needle catheter to occlude the injection site by applying gentle pressure. You must do this quickly before too much bleeding occurs and you lose visibility. After a further wait, I pull the catheter away, but again there is bleeding from the injection site. Why is polymerization not occurring? I recall a couple of years ago, the company making Histoacryl sent out a warning regarding a faulty batch of glue which had to be withdrawn. I hope that history isn't repeating itself. After more pressure, the catheter is pulled away, but again there is bleeding, so more pressure is applied. Eventually, after a total of about three minutes of pressure with the blunt end of the needle, the bleeding stops, much to everyone's relief. We now try to flush the needle with syringe 5 containing the 10 mils of water, but find that the needle is blocked. This is irksome, but not a disaster. Off camera, I extubate without pulling out the needle catheter from the scope, cut the end of the needle off and then remove the catheter thereby minimizing the risk of getting glue into the channel of the scope. I then reintubate 
and use a fresh needle for another round of gluing. The same sequence is followed. The needle is primed with two mils of sepoidal. The varix is pierced at a different site and the syringe containing the glue and lipoidal mixture is injected followed by a 2 mil chaser of lipoidal to push the glue into the varix. After a period of waiting, the needle is pulled out and thankfully on this occasion there is no bleeding. The needle is flushed with 10 mils of water before extubation. Hence, in all, 1 mil of hysterectyl glue was used in this procedure. After endoscopy, the patient remained hemodynamically stable with a hemoglobin of around 80 grams per liter. A blood transfusion was not necessary and we continued with terlipressin and antibiotics. A triple phase CT scan was performed to determine vessel patency two days after the endoscopy. On these coronal views of the venous phase, we can see the polymerized glue lipoidal mixture in the fundus of the stomach. There is splenomegaly. The portal vein is patent and the liver outline is irregular in keeping with cirrhosis. On the transverse views we can see a small amount of ascites around the liver which again appears irregular. The glue can be seen in the fundus of the stomach and there is splenomegaly. There is a small 17 mm cyst in segment 3 of the liver. This lesion was not enhancing in the arterial phase. It was decided to enter this patient into the REACT AVB trial. This acronym stands for Randomized Controlled Trial of Early Transjugular Intrahepatic Portosystemic Stent Shunt in Acute Variceal Bleeding. Basically, the trial compares early prophylactic tips versus standard of care in patients presenting with variceal bleeding. A summary of the study protocol is shown here. After the initial endoscopic control of the variceal bleed, patients are randomized to having either a tips procedure within four days of endoscopy or receiving standard of care, by, by which we mean endotherapy and non-selective beta blocker prophylaxis. The primary outcome is transplant-free survival at 12 months. Our patient was randomized to the TIPS arm of the study and was therefore transferred to the local liver unit where he had the TIPS procedure performed approximately 90 hours after the endoscopy. Here we see the TIPS procedure. A right internal jugular vein approach was used and a 10 French sheath was introduced. The right hepatic vein is opacified. A Roche Ukida system is used to puncture the right hepatic vein and access the right portal vein. A tract is created between the right hepatic vein and the right portal vein. And a guide wire is passed into the superior mesentric vein. The tract is dilated with an 8 mm balloon passed over the wire. A catheter with distance markers is passed through the tract down to the SMV. Then 
uh, 8 cm long by 8 mm diameter go vioto covered stent is deployed thus connecting the right hepatic vein with the right portal vein after deployment the stent was dilated to 8 mm with a balloon on this image you can see the deployed stent on the left and the glue on the right a venogram shows good flow along the stent This slide summarizes the pressures before and after stent placement. Initially, the free hepatic vein pressure was 15 mm mercury with a wedge pressure of 33 mm mercury, giving a hepatic vein pressure gradient of 18 mm mercury. The direct portal vein pressure was 30 mm mercury with an IVC pressure of 11 mm, giving a portal systemic gradient of 19 mm mercury. Post stenting, the portal systemic gradient fell to 10 mm mercury. Following the TIPS procedure, the patient remained hemodynamically stable. He was commenced on prophylactic rifaximin. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. See you in the next one.